Book Talk begins at 10 minutes and 23 seconds. Emma begins with episode 649 and ends today. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 678, End of the This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by our lovely supporters from all over the internet. And this week, we would like to highlight Edita Niemska, Marcy Gessel, Shelley Allen, Sharon Stewart, and Julia Mead. Thank you so much for all of your support. We could not do this without you. All right. We have the end of our book today, which means we have quite a bit of audio to listen to, which is fine, because you don't need me a whole lot. But there are a couple of really interesting things that are going on. So I want to make sure that the ones that you need a heads up for you get. But first, I need to announce the winner of the quilt. This wonderful quilt made by Anne in Tennessee. Thank you so much for doing this and donating it to Craftlet. I'm so excited to get to share this with somebody. And that somebody is Amy Lodu. So I will be popping that sucker in the mail for you tomorrow. I am so excited to send this to you. I can't wait. I just can't wait to see what you think. (sighs) Good days. Good, good days. So there won't be any more uh, raffling anything off through the end of October. We'll have new... Actually, will we have new things? We might have new things in November. November is going to be interesting. November 10th. Sunday, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, we will have our post Emma live stream. What does that mean? That means that you may have comments, thoughts, questions, things that I got wrong, things that I got right that surprised you, anything. Share those with us and we will do another QA live stream this time for the end of the book. So, spoilers abound. But it'll be Becca and me, and again, we're trying to get Aditi, but now she's even busier, so I don't know if we'll get her, but if we do, it'll be loads of fun. If you have video you want to send in, please just film it with your phone and email it to heather at craftlet.com. If you have just audio that you want to share, 206-350-1642, or as I said before, you can type out a comment and mail it to heather at craftlet.com. I'm also going to be culling the comments that we're getting over on YouTube. So anything that seems like it would be a good topic of discussion for our postbook live stream, I will add that in as well. Please, 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 when you contact us, make sure that you let me know how to name you. If you want your actual name used, your first name used, pen name, whatever you want, just let me let me know your nom de plume or your nom de speak or whatever it is that you decide to send me, nom de video. By the time this episode airs, we will have done our book party for Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House, which the more I learn about Shirley Jackson, and I forgot to give you a link last week to a, a video, charming little video with her son, the more that I am learning about her, her life was actually not all that different from like Sylvia Plath and Lucy Maud Montgomery. I wasn't wrong, but evidently her relationship with her children was not miserable. The the child that you see in the video is certainly pleasantly well-adjusted. He's just lovely. But yeah, she seems like she would be such a strong feminist author, and she is, but her relationships with women, specifically her mother, were complicated. If you read or, or watched the movie from the 90s, like Water for Chocolate, that kind of relationship with mom, but maybe actually worse, which is not great. Anyway, Shirley Jackson, I wish 
we could do her books. They are not public domain. So maybe someday we'll be able to. But for now, no, not so much. We are continuing to add spooky stories as both premiums and I'm adding Dracula, slowly but surely adding Dracula to YouTube. By the time this airs, I hope I'm done. But I got to tell you, I am doing better, which is great. Like I'll get four or five almost normal days and then I'm flat for two or three. The thing that is still killing me the most is being on a screen, being online. And there are things that I just cannot do, like uploading Dracula without being on a big screen because there are so many moving pieces that I need to address when I'm doing that. So it's it's certainly taken me longer than it should have. And I apologize for that. But it's going to happen before Halloween. You're going to have all of Dracula up there. And people who get bonus audio will be getting some spooky bonus audio later this week. I'm very excited. So yeah, by the time this airs, you should have some new spooky audio for you as well. I've also been getting some support over at the craftlet.com website to get it to be more functional, both behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. And as a consequence, for perhaps the first time ever, we have a really beautiful library. We've organized it by a genre button, which means if you just click on the library menu at the top of the screen, you will see what looks like a load of books. Those are all, I think they're coming out as the most recent books is what's getting fed to that page, which is great. But then all of the genres of books that we've covered are listed there. And some books obviously fall into multiple genres, but we had to go with you know kind of the main one. So if you have a problem with the main one that I chose, please let me know because it's totally easily changeable now. But once you click on one of those genre buttons, you will see all of the books in that genre. And you'll see the little book icon. And then if you click to the listen button, it'll take you to the page that has all of the episodes in order listed out for you, all pretty and everything. And oh my goodness, it has made me so happy. So huge thanks to Kashif for helping me with this. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited that I found him because he understands what we're doing and why the Craftlet website is so complicated. Nobody does shows like this. Nobody does podcasts like this. Nobody has 678 episodes that are this long and have book stuff attached to them. So I just, uh, it made my heart happy to find him. He's been so nice to me and doesn't make fun of me at all for being an idiot. So that's great. Because, you know, it happens when you're like, I think I should be able to do this, or at least I was able to do this on WordPress 2.0. And now, not so much. And I don't understand. Some texts will tell you you're an idiot or just stop talking to you. And there's our new tech who's just lovely. So happy things over there for you. I'm very excited. We also got a voice message from Corviday. And I'm actually going to save some of what she comments on because she she binged a whole bunch of episodes all at once. And I'm going to save some of her episode-specific comments for the live stream to use as topics then. Um, so we'll be able to play some of her audio then. But I did want to let you hear, she had some useful information when we were talking about Ridwell and I was mentioning how back in the day I had really thought it would be cool to do kind of an adobe chicken house made with the water bottles. Corviday had some information about water bottles that I think is useful, not, not just if you're going to build a chicken coop, honestly, but if you're trying to reuse, reduce, reuse, recycle, if you're trying to reuse or repurpose plastics in any way. I am going to play this for you at the end of today's episode because I think that that is both timely and useful information. They also reinforce the fact that arrowroot don't use it as a thickener when the heat is on, but once the heat is off, stirring in arrowroot thickens up sauces and saucy things <laughs> beautifully. So uh, it gets weird if you make it hot, but if it's just room temperature or cooler, it'll be just fine. So that was, that's still a good thing to know. I'm glad to find out that that was correct and not just correct, but now confirmed 
I no longer worry about that. All right, so the end of Emma. I said there were several different things that I wanted to share with you, and so here we go with those things. First, just like on I Love Lucy episodes, we have to speak about pregnancy in coded terms. So there will be talk today about Mrs. Weston's safety, and we are talking about safety during childbirth. So if that's a spoiler, if you thought it was going to end tragically with Mrs. Weston getting harmed, I'm, I'm sorry, I just gave it away. There it is. You're just going to have to live with it. But yeah, it's just referred to as her safety and then kind of never again. The baby is mentioned later by name, but how Mrs. Weston is doing is not mentioned again by name. She's, we just know she's fine after this. Emma and Mr. Knightley have an interesting conversation about Mrs. Weston being excellent at raising girls. Mr. Knightley, as you might expect, has some fun with that topic. But Emma comes back at him with a reference to a very long French title. And what this is, there was a book that was written in French and then it was translated into English. The original French book was written in 1782 and the English translation came out almost immediately after it's 1783. The English translation is the only one I'm going to even try and pronounce. It's Adelaide and Theodore. And in this story, there is a character who successfully educated her niece and decides that she is going to use everything she learned about that positive experience and apply it to her own child. And so all this is, is Emma saying, yes, we've seen this happen before in literature. And this book's been around for a while. So this is not like news. This is 1783. It's been around a minute. So that's, that's all that is, is it's a book that very many people may easily have come across in translation during Jane Austen's lifetime. That's all. You are going to hear a, a lovely little callback, but even a more intricate callback to perfection, our, our model of perfection being M and A. And we went through the whole philosophical study about what that was supposed to be trying to measure the whole measurement of morality and virtue. So we are going to have to rely on our British listeners to let us know if this is correct. But apparently in the Book of Common Prayer, the marriage solemnization, the, the marriage service, the groom and the bride are labeled M, the little letter M, and N, the letter N, like like variables, but which, I mean, they are. So Okay, but M and N are listed. We also have M, Emma, and N, phonetic, nightly. So Jane Austen does a little cool little dance there, if, if that's true. So listeners who know the Book of Common Prayer, please let us know if this is wrong. 206-350-1642, or you can email heather at craftlet.com. Oh, I so hope it's true, because I just, it's Jane Austen's family loved puns, and multi-layered puns are the best, and this one just is having fun, and I, how perfect for the end of this book. So towards the end of chapter 53, our first chapter for today of three, you will hear a reference to the difficulty of disposing of poor Mr. Woodhouse. This is not them trying to Agatha Christie-like dispose of Mr. Woodhouse. It's how do you keep him occupied? How do you get him to bide his time doing something that he finds pleasant so other people can get on with other things that they need to do? That's all that means. It's It comes across a little sketch these days, but that's all it is. And I do want to bring to mind just how easy it was for infants to die, especially in their first three to five months of life at this time period. I mean, it's still maternal mortality and infant mortality are still way too high. But the, one of the subtle ways that Jane Austen will let you know that everything is fine is she'll mention Mrs. Weston's daughter outgrowing a set of caps. So the little bonnets that would keep their little head warm. You know, you kids at that age grow very quickly. And the growth and replacement of caps would be an indication of the health of the child, but also the fact the child outgrew a complete set of caps, like birth to three months. 
that's an important marker of time. And we, you know, those are the kinds of things that we just don't find in, in literature that was written by men. So that's one of the, the other reasons that I think it's kind of fun to read these is you get these little nuggets of what actual day-to-day -day life really was like. There's also a, a snarky comment by Mrs. Elton that we're going to talk about on the flip side, because I don't think it means what I think it means to her. You'll understand. It's the end of chapter 53, and then we go into chapter 54. Emma's look of awe, jaw-dropping, gobsmackedness, is described as speaking amazement, which I just love. And it's kind of a callback to persuasion with Captain Wentworth. Captain Wentworth's bright, proud eyes spoke. The heart goes pitter-patter. That's just so lovely. So that was that was one thing. There's uh, several comments about going to Astley's in London. Astley's was kind of like a expo center or kind of a carnival, but it was a permanent location. So, you know, they do people jumping on and off of horses and jugglers and stuff like that. So you could take the kids. So it wasn't like a circus. Oh, look at Barnum and Bailey's giant sad elephant. This is a lot more A, humane, and B, more of like kind of, it sounds like proto-vaudeville. And at this point in time, there actually were two Astleys, uh, one that was really just open during good weather, and then one that was in a different location that ran during the, the colder months as well. But people referred to them both as Astleys, even though they had slightly different names. So we don't know which one they're going to. It sounds like it's probably the main one. But that's what Astleys was, and I did not know that. So I hope that's a nice little tidbit for you as well. Emma is going to talk about Mr. Knightley talking about drills, new drills. And I thought, well, sure. I mean, he's a farmer, so you probably have to, you know, reopen your well for water. So sure, I guess you'd have drills and drill bits. Why not? It turns out that I'm wrong. I am wrong. And I'm wrong for a really cool reason. There was a new invention, new-ish invention, it had been kicking for a while. 1701, there was a seed drill that was invented, which is kind of like, if you've ever seen one of the grass seed spreaders where it's a kind of a bin that has a handle on it and has a little turn crank, and at the bottom of the turn crank, it's like a meat grinder. It's got a spiral on it so that you can get it to, in a, a slightly more regulated way, disperse the seed out from the bucket that you're carrying around. This was started with, as far as I can tell, started with, at least in the Western world, the seed drill that Emma's referring to. And I thought that was so cool. But even cooler is the name of the person who invented it. And especially for people my age in the United States, please sit down. The inventor's name was Jethro Tull. And I'm not making that up. I just couldn't. I'm I'm so happy. <laughs> that just made me so excited. There's also a throwaway comment about the dimensions of some famous ox. It's because people were doing, you know, breeding routines. People were both with plants, with plant grafting, but also with how you were breeding your animals. They were trying to obviously breed bigger and healthier animals all the time. It was certainly much easier for somebody to maybe break even on food production if the animals that they had could produce more product, whether it was wool or meat or whatever. So there was a thing called the Durham ox. He allegedly weighed, and I'm reading this off the book because I will not remember this. He allegedly weighed 2,646 pounds when it died in 1807. That is a big ox. That is a really big ox. You can find there were paintings done at the time of the ox, kind of sketchy, watercolory paintings that, I mean, sure, I would just to paint the silly ox next to a human so you could see how big this thing was. I mean, that ain't nothing. So, yeah, it's not a surprise that Emma knew about these two things, that she knew about the seed drill. By this time, it would be like having a rake or a hoe or you know, some basic implement that is useful on a farm. And she certainly lives in a rural area. She would have heard about it. But also, it sounds like this great ox 
would have been a topic of conversation for a very long time. <laughs> it's, it's a big ox. Don't forget Frank Churchill's mistake when he had learned from Jane Fairfax something about Mr. Perry getting a carriage, and then there was some other thing about Mr. Dixon, and and Frank really almost gave up the secret to everybody of what was going on between him and Jane Fairfax. But that particular point in time also involved Emma, and Emma being kind of catty about Mr. Dixon and the word games and things like that. So there's going to be a callback to that. I just didn't want you to have forgotten about it. And that is going to be the end of our pre-chapter book talk. Because our final chapter, chapter 54, is really quite brief. It's it's the wrapping up of all of the, the loose ends. Now that we've untied all the knots, we can tie everything in a bow. And so our last chapter is tying it all up nice in a bow for you. So let's listen to the chapters for chapter 53, 54, and 55 of Emma. This is finishing off our book. If you are listening to your own version of this audiobook, please skip ahead to one hour, four minutes, and 55 seconds. All right, here we go. Volume 3, Chapter 17 Mrs. Weston's friends were all made happy by her safety, and if the satisfaction of her well-doing could be increased to Emma, it was by knowing her to be the mother of a little girl. She had been decided in wishing for a Miss Weston. She would not acknowledge that it was with any view of making a match for her hereafter with either of Isabella's sons, but she was convinced that a daughter would suit both mother and father best. It would be a great comfort to Mr. Weston as he grew older, and even Mr. Weston might be growing older ten years hence, to have his fireside enlivened by the sports and the nonsense, the freaks and the fancies of a child never banished from home. And Mrs. Weston, no one could doubt that a daughter would be most to her, and it would be quite a pity that any one who so well knew how to teach should not have their powers and exercise again. "'She has had the advantage, you know, of practising on me,' she continued. "'Like la baronne d'Allemagne and la comtesse d'Ostali, in Madame de Genlis, Adelaide, and Theodore, and we shall now see her own little Adelaide educated on a more perfect plan.' "'That is,' replied Mr. Knightley, "'she will indulge her even more than she did you, and believe that she does not indulge her at all. It will be the only difference.' "'Poor child!' cried Emma. At that rate, what will become of her? Nothing very bad. The fate of thousands. She will be disagreeable in infancy, and correct herself as she grows older. I am losing all my bitterness against spoiled children, my dearest Emma. I, who am owing all my happiness to you, would not it be horrible ingratitude in me to be severe on them? Emma laughed and replied, But I had the assistance of all your endeavours to counteract the indulgence of other people— I doubt whether my own sense would have corrected me without it. Do you? I have no doubt. Nature gave you understanding. Miss Taylor gave you principles. You must have done well. My interference was quite as likely to do harm as good. It was very natural for you to say, what right has he to lecture me? And I am afraid very natural for you to feel that it was done in a disagreeable manner. I do not believe I did you any good— the good was all to myself, by making you an object of the tenderest affection to me. I could not think about you so much without doting on you, faults and all, and by dint of fancying so many errors, have been in love with you ever since you were thirteen at least. "'I am sure you were of use to me,' cried Emma. "'I was very often influenced rightly by you, oftener than I would own at the time. I am very sure you did me good.' and if poor little Anna Weston is to be spoiled, it will be the greatest humanity in you to do as much for her as you have always done for me, except falling in love with her when she is thirteen. How often, when you were a girl, have you said to me, with one of your saucy looks, Mr. Knightley, I am going to do so and so, Papa says I may, or I have Miss Taylor's leave, something which, you knew, I did not approve, in such cases my interference was giving you two bad feelings instead of one. What an amiable creature I was! No wonder you should hold my speeches in such affectionate remembrance. Mr. Knightley, you always called me Mr. Knightley, and from habit it has not so very formal a sound, and yet it is formal. I want you to call me something else, but I do not know what. I remember once calling you George, in one of my amiable fits about ten years ago. I did it because I thought it would offend you, 
but as you made no objection, I never did it again. And cannot you call me George now? Impossible! I never can call you anything but Mr. Knightley. I will not promise even to equal the elegant terseness of Mrs. Elton by calling you Mr. K. But I will promise, she added presently, laughing and blushing, I will promise to call you once by your Christian name. I do not say when, but perhaps you may guess where, in the building in which N takes M, for better, for worse. Emma grieved that she could not be more openly just to one important service which his better sense would have rendered her, to the advice which would have saved her from the worst of all her womanly follies, her willful intimacy with Harriet Smith. But it was too tender a subject. She could not enter on it. Harriet was very seldom mentioned between them. This, on his side, might merely proceed from her not being thought of, but Emma was rather inclined to attribute it to delicacy, and a suspicion, from some appearances that their friendship was declining. She was aware herself that parting under any other circumstances, they certainly should have corresponded more, and that her intelligence would not have rested, as it now almost wholly did, on Isabella's letters. He might observe that it was so— the pain of being obliged to practice concealment towards him was very little inferior to the pain of having made Harriet unhappy. Isabella sent quite as good an account of her visitor as could be expected. On her first arrival she had thought her out of spirits, which appeared perfectly natural as there was a dentist to be consulted. But since that business had been over, she did not appear to find Harriet different from what she had known her before. Isabella, to be sure, was no very quick observer, yet if Harriet had not been equal to playing with the children, it would not have escaped her. Emma's comforts and hopes were most agreeably carried on, by Harriet's being to stay longer. Her fortnight was likely to be a month at least. Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley were to come down in August, and she was invited to remain till they could bring her back. "'John does not even mention your friend,' said Mr. Knightley. "'Here is his answer, if you like to see it.' It was the answer to the communication of his intended marriage. Emma accepted it with a very eager hand, with an impatience all alive to know what he would say about it, and not at all checked by hearing that her friend was unmentioned. "'John enters like a brother into my happiness,' continued Mr. Knightley. "'But he is no complimenter, and though I well know him to have, likewise, a most brotherly affection for you, he is so far from making flourishes that any other young woman might think him rather cool in her praise.' but I am not afraid of your seeing what he writes. He writes like a sensible man, replied Emma when she had read the letter. I honour his sincerity. It is very plain that he considers the good fortune of the engagement as all on my side, but that he is not without hope of my growing in time, as worthy of your affection as you think me already. Had he said anything to bear a different construction, I should not have believed him. My Emma, he means no such thing. He only means— "'He and I should differ very little in our estimation of the two, interrupted she, with a sort of serious smile. "'Much less, perhaps, than he is aware of, if we could enter without ceremony or reserve on the subject. "'Emma, my dear Emma!' "'Oh!' she cried, with more thorough gaiety. "'If you fancy your brothers did not do me justice, only wait till my dear father is in the secret and hear his opinion. Depend upon it, he will be much farther from doing you justice. He will think all the happiness, all the advantage on your side of the question, all the merit on mine. I wish I may not sink into poor Emma with him at once. His tender compassion towards oppressed worth can go no farther. Ah, he cried, I wish your father might be half as easily convinced as John will be, of our having every right that equal worth can give to be happy together. I am amused by one part of John's letter. Did you notice it? where he says that my information did not take him wholly by surprise, that he was rather an expectation of hearing something of the kind. "'If I understand your brother, he only means so far as your having some thoughts of marrying. He had no idea of me. He seems perfectly unprepared for that.' "'Yes, yes, but I am amused that he should have seen so far into my feelings. What has he been judging by? I am not conscious of any difference in my spirits or conversation that could prepare him at this time for my marrying any more than at another.' but it was so, I suppose. I dare say there was a difference when I was staying with him the other day. I believe I did not play with the children quite so much as usual. I remember one evening the poor boy saying, "'Uncle seems always tired now.' The time was coming when the news must spread farther, and other persons' reception of it tried. 
As soon as Mrs. Weston was sufficiently recovered to admit Mr. Woodhouse's visits, Emma, having it in view that her gentle reasoning should be employed in the cause, resolved first to announce it at home, and then at Randall's. But how to break it to her father at last! She had bound herself to do it, in such an hour of Mr. Knightley's absence, or when it came to the point her heart would have failed her, and she must have put it off. But Mr. Knightley was to come at such a time, and follow up the beginning she was to make. She was forced to speak, and to speak cheerfully, too. She must not make it a more decided subject of misery to him, by a melancholy tone herself. She must not appear to think it a misfortune. With all the spirit she could command, she prepared him first for something strange, and then, in a few words, said that if his consent and approbation could be attained, which she trusted would be attended with no difficulty, since it was a plan to promote the happiness of all, she and Mr. Knightley meant to marry by which means Hartfield would receive the constant addition of that person's company, whom she knew he loved, next to his daughters and Mrs. Weston, best in the world. Poor man! It was at first a considerable shock to him, and he tried earnestly to dissuade her from it. She was reminded more than once of having always said she would never marry, and assured that it would be a great deal better for her to remain single, and told of poor Isabella and poor Miss Taylor. But it would not do. Emma hung about him affectionately, and smiled, and said it must be so, and that he must not class her with Isabella and Mrs. Weston, whose marriages taking them from Hartfield, had indeed made a melancholy change. But she was not going from Hartfield. She should always be there. She was introducing no change in their numbers or their comforts but for the better, and she was very sure that he would be a great deal the happier for having Mr. Knightley always at hand, when he were once got used to the idea. Did not he love Mr. Knightley very much? He would not deny that he did, she was sure. Whom did he ever want to consult on business but Mr. Knightley? Who was so useful to him? Who so ready to write his letters? Who so glad to assist him? Who so cheerful, so attentive, so attached to him? Would not he like to have him always on the spot? Yes, that was all very true. Mr. Knightley could not be there too often. He should be glad to see him every day. But they did see him every day as it was. Why could not they go on as they had done? Mr. Woodhouse could not be soon reconciled, but the worst was overcome. The idea was given. Time and continual repetition must do the rest. To Emma's entreaties and assurances succeeded Mr. Knightley's, whose fond praise of her gave the subject even a kind of welcome, and he was soon used to be talked to by each on every fair occasion. They had all the assistance which Isabella could give, by letters of the strongest approbation, and Mrs. Weston was ready on the first meeting to consider the subject in the most serviceable light, first as a settled, and secondly as a good one, well aware of the nearly equal importance of the two recommendations to Mr. Woodhouse's mind. It was agreed upon as what was to be, and everybody by whom he was used to be guided assuring him that it would be for his happiness, and having some feelings himself which almost admitted it, he began to think that some time or other— in another year or two, perhaps, it might not be so very bad if the marriage did take place. Mrs. Weston was acting no part, feigning no feelings in all that she said to him in favour of the event. She had been extremely surprised, never more so, than when Emma first opened the affair to her, but she saw in it only increase of happiness to all, and had no scruple in urging him to the utmost. She had such a regard for Mr. Knightley as to think he deserved even her dearest Emma, and it was in every respect so proper, suitable, and unexceptionable a connection, and in one respect one point of the highest importance, so peculiarly eligible, so singularly fortunate, that now it seemed as if Emma could not safely have attached herself to any other creature, and that she had herself been the stupidest of beings in not having thought of it, and wished it long ago." How very few of those men in a rank of life to address Emma would have renounced their own home for Hartfield! And who but Mr. Knightley could know and bear with Mr. Woodhouse, so as to make such an arrangement desirable? The difficulty of disposing of poor Mr. Woodhouse had always been felt in her husband's plans and her own for a marriage between Frank and Emma. How to settle the claims of Enscombe and Hartfield had been a continual impediment, less acknowledged by Mr. Weston than by herself, but even he had never been able to finish the subject better than by saying, "'Those matters will take care of themselves. The young people will find a way.' But here there was nothing to be shifted off in a wild speculation on the future. It was all right, all open, all equal. No sacrifice on any side worth the name." It was a union of the highest promise of felicity in itself, and without one real rational difficulty to oppose or delay it. 
Mrs. Weston, with her baby on her knee, indulging in such reflections as these, was one of the happiest women in the world. If anything could increase her delight, it was perceiving that the baby would soon have outgrown its first set of caps. The news was universally a surprise wherever it spread, and Mr. Weston had his five minutes' share of it. But five minutes were enough to familiarize the idea to his quickness of mind. He saw the advantages of the match, and rejoiced in them with all the constancy of his wife. But the wonder of it was very soon nothing, and by the end of an hour he was not far from believing that he had always foreseen it. It is to be a secret, I conclude, said he. These matters are always a secret, till it is found out that everybody knows them. Only let me be told when I may speak out. I wonder whether Jane has any suspicion. He went to Highbury the next morning, and satisfied himself on that point. He told her the news. Was not she like a daughter, his eldest daughter? He must tell her, and Miss Bates being present, it passed, of course, to Mrs. Cole, Mrs. Perry, and Mrs. Elton immediately afterwards. It was no more than the principals were prepared for. They had calculated from the time of its being known at Randalls how soon it would be over Highbury, and were thinking of themselves as the evening wonder in many a family circle, with great sagacity. In general, it was a very well approved match. Some might think him, and others might think her, the most in luck. One set might recommend their all removing to Donwell and leaving Hartfield for the John Knightleys, and another might predict disagreements among their servants. But yet upon the whole there was no serious objection raised, except in one habitation, the vicarage. There the surprise was not softened by any satisfaction. Mr. Elton cared little about it compared with his wife. He only hoped, the young lady's pride would now be contented, and supposed she had always meant to catch nightly if she could, and on the point of living at Hartfield could daringly exclaim, rather he than I. But Mrs. Elton was very much discomposed indeed. Poor Knightley, poor fellow, sad business for him. She was extremely concerned, for though very eccentric, he had a thousand good qualities. How could he be so taken in? Did not think him at all in love, not in the least. Poor Knightley, there would be an end of all pleasant intercourse with him. How happy he had been to come and dine with them whenever they asked him. But that would be all over now. Poor fellow, no more exploring parties to Donwell made for her. Oh, no, there would be a Mrs. Knightley to throw cold water on everything. Extremely disagreeable. But she was not at all sorry that she had abused the housekeeper the other day. Shocking plan, living together. It would never do. She knew a family near Maple Grove who had tried it, and been obliged to separate before the end of the first quarter. End of chapter 17 Volume 3 Chapter 18 Time passed on. A few more to-morrows, and the party from London would be arriving. It was an alarming change, and Emma was thinking of it one morning, as what must bring a great deal to agitate and grieve her, when Mr. Knightley came in, and distressing thoughts were put by. After the first chat of pleasure he was silent, and then in a graver tone began with, "'I have something to tell you, Emma. Some news.' "'Good or bad?' said she, quickly, looking up in his face. "'I do not know what it ought to be called.' "'Oh, good, I am sure.' I can see it in your countenance. You are trying not to smile. I am afraid, said he, composing his features. I am very much afraid, my dear Emma, that you will not smile when you hear it. Indeed? But why so? I can hardly imagine that anything which pleases or amuses you should not please and amuse me, too. There is one subject, he replied, I hope but one, on which we do not think alike. He paused a moment, again smiling with his eyes fixed on her face. "'Does nothing occur to you? Do not you recollect? Harriet Smith!' Her cheeks flushed at the name, and she felt afraid of something, though she knew not what. "'Have you heard from her yourself this morning?' cried he. "'You have, I believe, and know the whole.' "'No, I have not. I know nothing. Pray tell me.' "'You are prepared for the worst, I see, and very bad it is.' Harriet Smith marries Robert Martin. Emma gave a start, which did not seem like being prepared, and her eyes in eager gaze said, No, this is impossible. But her lips were closed. It is so indeed, continued Mr. Knightley. I have it from Robert Martin himself. He left me not half an hour ago. She was still looking at him with the most speaking amazement. 
You like it, my Emma, as little as I feared. I wish our opinions were the same. But in time they will. Time, you may be sure, will make one or the other of us think differently, and in the meanwhile we need not talk much on the subject. You mistake me. You quite mistake me, she replied, exerting herself. It is not that such a circumstance would now make me unhappy, but I cannot believe it. It seems an impossibility. You cannot mean to say that Harriet Smith has accepted Robert Martin. You cannot mean that he has even proposed to her again, yet. You only mean that he intends it. I mean that he has done it, answered Mr. Knightley, with smiling but determined decision, and has been accepted. Good God! she cried. Well! Then, having recourse to her work-basket an excuse for leaning down her face, and concealing all the exquisite feelings of delight and entertainment which she knew she must be expressing, she added, "'Well, now tell me everything. Make this intelligible to me. How? Where? When? Let me know at all. I never was more surprised. But it does not make me unhappy, I assure you. How? How has it been possible?' "'It is a very simple story.' He went to town on business three days ago, and I got him to take charge of some papers which I was wanting to send to John. He delivered these papers to John at his chambers, and was asked by him to join their party the same evening to Astley's. They were going to take the two eldest boys to Astley's. The party was to be our brother and sister, Henry, John, and Miss Smith. My friend Robert could not resist. They called for him in their way, were all extremely amused, and my brother asked him to dine with them the next day, which he did, and in the course of that visit, as I understand, he found an opportunity of speaking to Harriet, and certainly did not speak in vain. She made him, by her acceptance, as happy even as he is deserving. He came down by yesterday's coach, and was with me this morning immediately after breakfast, to report his proceedings, first on my affairs, and then on his own." This is all that I can relate of the how, where, and when. Your friend Harriet will make a much longer history when you see her. She will give you all the minute particulars which only woman's language can make interesting. In our communications we deal only in the great. However, I must say that Robert Martin's heart seemed for him, and to me, very overflowing, and that he did mention, without its being much to the purpose, that on quitting their box at Astley's, my brother took charge of Mrs. John Knightley and little John, and he followed with Miss Smith and Henry, and that at one time they were in such a crowd as to make Miss Smith rather uneasy. He stopped. Emma dared not attempt any immediate reply. To speak, she was sure, would be to betray a most unreasonable degree of happiness. She must wait a moment, or he would think her mad. Her silence disturbed him, and after observing her a little while, he added, "'Emma, my love, you said that this circumstance would now not make you unhappy, but I am afraid it gives you more pain than you expected. His situation is an evil, but you must consider it as what satisfies your friend. And I will answer for your thinking better and better of him as you know him more. His good sense and good principles would delight you.' As far as the man is concerned, you could not wish your friend in better hands. His rank and society I would alter if I could, which is saying a great deal, I assure you, Emma. You laugh at me about William Larkins, but I could quite as ill spare Robert Martin. He wanted her to look up and smile, and having now brought herself not to smile too broadly, she did, cheerfully answering, You need not be at any pains to reconcile me to the match. I think Harriet is doing extremely well. Her connections may be worse than his. In respectability of character, there can be no doubt that they are. I have been silent from surprise, merely, excessive surprise. You cannot imagine how suddenly it has come on me, how peculiarly unprepared I was, for I had reason to believe her very lately more determined against him, much more than she was before. "'You ought to know your friend best,' replied Mr. Knightley. But I should say she was a good-tempered, soft-hearted girl, not likely to be very, very determined against any young man who told her he loved her. Emma could not help laughing as she answered, "'Upon my word, I believe you know her quite as well as I do. But, Mr. Knightley, are you perfectly sure that she has absolutely and downright accepted him? I could suppose she might in time. But can she already? Did not you misunderstand him?' You were both talking of other things, of business, shows of cattle, or new drills, and might not you, in the confusion of so many subjects, mistake him? It was not Harriet's hand that he was certain of, it was the dimensions of some famous ox. 
The contrast between the countenance and air of Mr. Knightley and Robert Martin was, at this moment, so strong to Emma's feelings, and so strong was the recollection of all that had so recently passed on Harriet's side, so fresh the sound of these words spoken with such an emphasis, "'No, I hope I know better than to think of Robert Martin,' that she was really expecting the intelligence to prove in some measure premature. It could not be otherwise. "'Do you dare say this?' cried Mr. Knightley. "'Do you dare to suppose me so great a blockhead as not to know what a man is talking of? What do you deserve?' "'Oh, I always deserve the best treatment, because I never put up with any other. And therefore you must give me a plain, direct answer. Are you quite sure that you understand the terms on which Mr. Martin and Harriet now are?' "'I am quite sure,' he replied, speaking very distinctly, "'that he told me she had accepted him, and that there was no obscurity, nothing doubtful, in the words he used, and I think I can give you a proof that it must be so. He asked my opinion as to what he was now to do. He knew of no one but Mrs. Goddard to whom he could apply for information of her relations or friends. Could I mention anything more fit to be done than go to Mrs. Goddard's? I assured him that I could not.' Then, he said, he would endeavour to see her in the course of his day. "'I am perfectly satisfied,' replied Emma, with the brightest smiles, "'and most sincerely wish them happy.' "'You are materially changed since we talked on this subject before.' "'I hope so, for at that time I was a fool.' "'And I am changed also, for I am now very willing to grant you all Harriet's good qualities.' I have taken some pains for your sake, and for Robert Martin's sake, whom I have always had reason to believe as much in love with her as ever, to get acquainted with her. I have often talked to her a good deal. You must have seen that I did. Sometimes, indeed, I have thought you were half suspecting me of pleading poor Martin's cause, which was never the case. But from all my observations I am convinced of her being an artless, amiable girl with very good notions, very seriously good principles, and placing her happiness in the affections and utility of domestic life. Much of this, I have no doubt, she may thank you for. Me! cried Emma, shaking her head. Ah, poor Harriet! She checked herself, however, and submitted quietly to a little more praise than she deserved. Their conversation was soon afterwards closed by the entrance of her father. She was not sorry. She wanted to be alone. Her mind was in a state of flutter and wonder which made it impossible for her to be collected. She was in dancing, singing, exclaiming spirits, and till she had moved about and talked to herself, and laughed and reflected, she could be fit for nothing rational. Her father's business was to announce James's being gone out to put the horses to, preparatory to their now daily drive to Randall's, and she had, therefore, an immediate excuse for disappearing. The joy, the gratitude, the exquisite delight of her sensations may be imagined. The sole grievance and alloy thus removed in the prospect of Harriet's welfare, she was really in danger of becoming too happy for security. What had she to wish for? Nothing but to grow more worthy of him, whose intentions and judgment had been so superior to her own. Nothing but that the lessons of her past folly might teach her humility and circumspection in future." Serious she was, very serious in her thankfulness, and in her resolutions, and yet there was no preventing a laugh, sometimes in the very midst of them. She must laugh at such a close, such an end of the doleful disappointment of five weeks back, such a heart, such a Harriet. Now there would be pleasure in her returning. Everything would be a pleasure. It would be a great pleasure to know Robert Martin." High in the rank of her most serious and heartfelt felicities was the reflection that all necessity of concealment from Mr. Knightley would soon be over. The disguise, equivocation, mystery, so hateful to her to practice, might soon be over. She could now look forward to giving him that full and perfect confidence which her disposition was most ready to welcome as a duty. In the gayest and happiest spirit she set forward with her father, not always listening, but always agreeing to what he said, and whether in speech or silence, conniving at the comfortable persuasion of his being obliged to go to Randall's every day, or poor Mrs. Weston would be disappointed. They arrived, Mrs. Weston was alone in the drawing-room, but hardly had they been told of the baby, and Mr. Woodhouse received the thanks for coming which he asked for, when a glimpse was caught through the blind of two figures passing near the window. "'It is Frank and Miss Fairfax,' said Mrs. Weston. "'I was just going to tell you of our agreeable surprise in seeing him arrive this morning. He stays till to-morrow, and Miss Fairfax has been persuaded to spend the day with us. They are coming in, I hope.' 
In half a minute they were in the room. Emma was extremely glad to see him, but there was a degree of confusion, a number of embarrassing recollections on each side. They met readily and smiling, but with a consciousness which at first allowed little to be said, and having all sat down again, there was for some time such a blank in the circle that Emma began to doubt whether the wish now indulged, which she had long felt, of seeing Frank Churchill once more, and of seeing him with Jane, would yield its proportion of pleasure. When Mr. Weston joined the party, however, and when the baby was fetched, there was no longer a want of subject or animation, or of courage and opportunity for Frank Churchill to draw near her and say, "'I have you to thank, Miss Woodhouse, for a very kind forgiving message in one of Mrs. Weston's letters. I hope time has not made you less willing to pardon. I hope you do not retract what you then said.' "'No, indeed,' cried Emma, most happy to begin. "'Not in the least. I am particularly glad to see and shake hands with you.' and to give you joy in person. He thanked her with all his heart, and continued some time to speak with serious feeling of his gratitude and happiness. "'Is not she looking well?' said he, turning his eyes towards Jane. "'Better than she ever used to do. You see how my father and Mrs. Weston dote upon her.' But his spirits were soon rising again, and with laughing eyes, after mentioning the expected return of the Campbells, he named the name of Dixon. Emma blushed, and forbade its being pronounced in her hearing. "'I can never think of it,' she cried, "'without extreme shame.' "'The shame,' he answered, "'is all mine, or ought to be. But is it possible that you had no suspicion? I mean of late. Early I know you had none. I never had the smallest, I assure you. That appears quite wonderful. I was once very near, and I wish I had. It would have been better.' but though I was always doing wrong things, they were very bad wrong things, and such as did me no service, it would have been a much better transgression had I broken the bond of secrecy and told you everything. "'It is not now worth a regret,' said Emma. "'I have some hope,' resumed he, "'of my uncle's being persuaded to pay a visit at Randall's. He wants to be introduced to her. When the Campbells are returned, we shall meet them in London, and continue there, I trust, till we may carry her northward. But now I am at such a distance from her— is not it hard, Miss Woodhouse? Till this morning we have not once met since the day of reconciliation. Do not you pity me? Emma spoke her pity so very kindly, that with a sudden accession of gay thought he cried, Ah, by the by, then sinking his voice and looking demure for the moment, I hope Mr. Knightley is well. He paused, she coloured and laughed. I know you saw my letter, and think you may remember my wish in your favour. Let me return your congratulations. I assure you that I have heard the news with the warmest interest and satisfaction. He is a man whom I cannot presume to praise. Emma was delighted, and only wanted him to go on in the same style, but his mind was in the next moment in his own concerns, and with his own Jane, and his next words were, "'Did you ever see such a skin, such smoothness, such delicacy, and yet without being actually fair?' one cannot call her fair. It is a most uncommon complexion, with her dark eyelashes and hair, a most distinguishing complexion, so peculiarly the lady in it, just colour enough for beauty. "'I have always admired her complexion,' replied Emma. "'But do not I remember the time when you found fault with her for being so pale, when we first began to talk of her? Have you quite forgotten?' "'Oh, no!' what an impudent dog I was! How could I dare? But he laughed so heartily at the recollection, that Emma could not help saying, I do suspect that in the midst of your perplexities at that time, you had very great amusement in tricking us all. I am sure you had. I am sure it was a consolation to you. Oh, no, no, no! How can you suspect me of such a thing? I was the most miserable wretch! Not quite so miserable as to be insensible to mirth. I am sure it was a source of high entertainment to you, to feel that you were taking us all in. Perhaps I am the readier to suspect, because, to tell you the truth, I think it might have been some amusement to myself in the same situation. I think there is a little likeness between us. He bowed. If not in our dispositions, she presently added, with a look of true sensibility, there is a likeness in our destiny— the destiny which bids fair to connect us with two characters so much superior to our own. True, true, he answered warmly. No, not true on your side. You can have no superior, but most true on mine. She is a complete angel. Look at her. Is she not an angel in every gesture? 
Observe the turn of her throat. Observe her eyes as she is looking up at my father. You will be glad to hear, inclining his head and whispering seriously, that my uncle means to give her all my aunt's jewels. They are to be new set. I am resolved to have some in an ornament for the head. Will it not be beautiful in her dark hair? Very beautiful indeed, replied Emma, and she spoke so kindly that he gratefully burst out. How delighted I am to see you again, and to see you in such excellent looks. I would not have missed this meeting for the world. I should certainly have called at Hartfield had you failed to come. The others had been talking of the child, Mrs. Weston giving an account of a little alarm she had been under the evening before, from the infant's appearing not quite well. She believed she had been foolish, but it had alarmed her, and she had been within half a minute of sending for Mr. Perry. Perhaps she ought to be ashamed, but Mr. Weston had been almost as uneasy as herself. In ten minutes, however, the child had been perfectly well again. This was her history, and particularly interesting it was to Mr. Woodhouse, who commended her very much for thinking of sending for Perry, and only regretted that she had not done it. She should always send for Perry if the child appeared in the slightest degree disordered, were it only for a moment. She could not be too soon alarmed, nor send for Perry too often. It was a pity, perhaps, that he had not come last night, for though the child seemed well now, very well considering, it would probably have been better if Perry had seen it. Frank Churchill caught the name. Perry, said he to Emma, and trying as he spoke to catch Miss Fairfax's eye, my friend Perry, what are they saying about Mr. Perry? Has he been here this morning? And how does he travel now? Has he set up his carriage? Emma soon recollected and understood him, and while she joined in the laugh, it was evident from Jane's countenance that she too was really hearing him, though trying to seem deaf. "'Such an extraordinary dream of mine,' he cried. "'I can never think of it without laughing.' "'She hears us, she hears us, Miss Woodhouse. I see it in her cheek, her smile, a vain attempt to frown. Look at her. Do not you see that, at this instant, the very passage of her own letter, which sent me the report, is passing under her eye, that the whole blunder is spread before her, that she can attend to nothing else, though pretending to listen to the others?' Jane was forced to smile completely for a moment, and the smile partly remained as she turned towards him, and said in a conscious, low, yet steady voice, "'How you can bear such recollections is astonishing to me. They will sometimes obtrude, but how you can court them!' He had a great deal to say in return, and very entertainingly, but Emma's feelings were chiefly with Jane in the argument, and on leaving Randall's and falling naturally into a comparison of the two men, she felt that pleased as she had been to see Frank Churchill, and really regarding him as she did with friendship, she had never been more sensible of Mr. Knightley's high superiority of character. The happiness of this most happy day received its completion, in the animated contemplation of his worth which this comparison produced. End of chapter 18 Volume 3, Chapter 19 If Emma had still at intervals an anxious feeling for Harriet, a momentary doubt of its being possible for her to be really cured of her attachment to Mr. Knightley, and really able to accept another man from unbiased inclination, it was not long that she had to suffer from the recurrence of any such uncertainty. A very few days brought the party from London, and she had no sooner an opportunity of being one hour alone with Harriet than she became perfectly satisfied, unaccountable as it was, that Robert Martin had thoroughly supplanted Mr. Knightley, and was now forming all her views of happiness. Harriet was a little distressed did look a little foolish at first, but having once owned that she had been presumptuous and silly and self-deceived before, her pain and confusion seemed to die away with the words, and leave her without a care for the past, and with the fullest exultation in the present and future, for as to her friend's approbation, Emma had instantly removed every fear of that nature, by meeting her with the most unqualified congratulations. Harriet was most happy to give every particular of the evening at Astley's, and the dinner the next day. She could dwell on it with the utmost delight. But what did such particulars explain? The fact was, as Emma could now acknowledge, that Harriet had always liked Robert Martin, and that his continuing to love her had been irresistible. Beyond this, it must ever be unintelligible to Emma. The event, however, was most joyful, and every day was giving her fresh reason for thinking so. Harriet's parentage became known. She proved to be the daughter of a tradesman, rich enough to afford her the comfortable maintenance which had been ever hers, and decent enough to have always wished for concealment. 
Such was the blood of gentility which Emma had formerly been so ready to vouch for. It was likely to be as untainted, perhaps, as the blood of many a gentleman, but what a connection had she been preparing for Mr. Knightley, or for the Churchills, or even for Mr. Elton! The stain of illegitimacy, unbleached by nobility or wealth, would have been a stain indeed. No objection was raised on the father's side. The young man was treated liberally. It was all as it should be, and as Emma became acquainted with Robert Martin, who was now introduced at Hartfield, she fully acknowledged in him all the appearance of sense and worth which could bid fairest for her little friend. She had no doubt of Harriet's happiness with any good-tempered man, but with him, and in the home he offered, there would be the hope of more, of security, stability, and improvement. She would be placed in the midst of those who loved her, and who had better sense than herself, retired enough for safety, and occupied enough for cheerfulness. She would never be led into temptation, nor left for it to find her out. She would be respectable and happy, and Emma admitted her to be the luckiest creature in the world, to have created so steady and persevering an affection in such a man, or, if not quite the luckiest, to yield only to herself. Harriet, necessarily drawn away by her engagements with the Martins, was less and less at Hartfield, which was not to be regretted. The intimacy between her and Emma must sink, their friendship must change into a calmer sort of goodwill, and fortunately what ought to be, and must be, seemed already beginning, and in the most gradual, natural manner. Before the end of September Emma attended Harriet to church, and saw her hand bestowed on Robert Martin with so complete a satisfaction as no remembrances, even connected with Mr. Elton as he stood before them, could impair. Perhaps, indeed, at that time she scarcely saw Mr. Elton, but as the clergyman whose blessing of the altar might next fall on herself. Robert Martin and Harriet Smith, the latest couple engaged of the three, were the first to be married. Jane Fairfax had already quitted Highbury, and was restored to the comforts of her beloved home with the Campbells. The Mr. Churchills were also in town, and they were only waiting for November. The intermediate month was the one fixed on, as far as they dared, by Emma and Mr. Knightley. They had determined that their marriage ought to be concluded while John and Isabella were still at Hartfield, to allow them the fortnight's absence in a tour to the seaside, which was the plan. John and Isabella, and every other friend, were agreed in approving it. But Mr. Woodhouse, how is Mr. Woodhouse to be induced to consent? He who had never yet alluded to their marriage, but as a distant event— when first sounded on the subject, he was so miserable that they were almost hopeless. A second allusion, indeed, gave less pain. He began to think it was to be, and that he could not prevent it, a very promising step of the mind on its way to resignation. Still, however, he was not happy. Nay, he appeared so much otherwise that his daughter's courage failed. She could not bear to see him suffering, to know him fancying himself neglected, and though her understanding almost acquiesced in the assurance of both the Mr. Knightleys, that when once the event were over his distress would soon be over too, she hesitated, she could not proceed. In this state of suspense they were befriended, not by any sudden illumination of Mr. Woodhouse's mind, or any wonderful change of his nervous system, but by the operation of the same system in another way— Mrs. Weston's poultry-house was robbed one night of all her turkeys, evidently by the ingenuity of man. Other poultry-yards in the neighbourhood also suffered. Pilfering was house-breaking to Mr. Woodhouse's fears. He was very uneasy, and but for the sense of his son-in-law's protection, would have been under wretched alarm every night of his life. The strength, resolution, and presence of mind of the Mr. Knightleys commanded his fullest dependence. While either of them protected him and his, Hartfield was safe." but Mr. John Knightley must be in London again by the end of the first week in November. The result of this distress was that, with a much more voluntary, cheerful consent than his daughter had ever presumed to hope for at the moment, she was able to fix her wedding day, and Mr. Elton was called on, within a month from the marriage of Mr. and Mrs. Robert Martin, to join the hands of Mr. Knightley and Miss Woodhouse. The wedding was very much like other weddings, where the parties have no taste for finery or parade, and Mrs. Elton, from the particulars detailed by her husband, thought it all extremely shabby, and very inferior to her own. "'Very little white satin, very few lace veils, a most pitiful business. Selina would stare when she heard of it.' But in spite of these deficiencies, the wishes, the hopes, the confidence, the predictions of the small band of true friends who witnessed the ceremony, were fully answered in the perfect happiness of the Union.
End of chapter 19. End of Emma by Jane Austen. Oh, I hope you enjoyed the end of the book. I, oh. I am going to save actually some of the bigger topics that I have written down for the live stream. And by the way, the live stream, even though it will be happening on YouTube, will have the links to it in Facebook. I do not have the computer power to be able to broadcast to both places at the same time. But once the live stream is over, we will take that audio and edit it and then release that as an audio podcast as well. So you don't have to watch the live stream. You don't have to go to YouTube. Certainly, if you're there watching the live stream, you can type into the chat and ask questions or make comments from there. Always welcome. But for today, for our last chapters, there's a thing that Knightley says about midway through the first chapter, chapter 53, that in our communication, we deal only in the great. He's talking about the difference between how men communicate and women communicate. Men, men are for Mars, women are for Venus, already kind of thing. But there's more to it than that. Because Emma was written before Walter Scott wrote this treatise on how fabulous Jane Austen was. And in his treatise, so post-Emma, honestly, it may actually have been after Jane Austen passed away. Yeah, actually, I think it was. So she, this couldn't have influenced her any, but you can see where Sir Walter Scott gets part of his commentary from, which is here. He was talking specifically in this part of his treatise on Pride and Prejudice, but it so applies to here as well. And it is, this is a quote from Sir Walter Scott. That young lady had a talent for describing the involvement and feelings and characters of ordinary life, which is to me the most wonderful I ever met with. The big bow wow strain, which I love, the big bow wow strain I can do myself like any now going, but the exquisite touch which renders ordinary, commonplace characters and things interesting from the truth of the description and sentiment, is denied to me. High freaking praise. And, I mean, the saddest thing is Jane Austen first is getting this praise after she's gone. I'm pretty sure this is after she's gone. But also Sir Walter Scott didn't sign this at the time, so nobody really put two and two together that Sir Walter Scott was really jamming on Jane Austen, which is just tragic. I don't know if you remember, it jumped out at me, uh, and I didn't want to preemptively jump out at you, but did you hear the reference to a blind? So way back when Emma was talking, I think, to Mrs. Weston about uh, Frank Churchill and, and all of his all of his actions towards her being nothing more than a blind, um, something that was concealing his real thoughts and feelings and, and his love for and arrangement with Jane Fairfax. So there's that kind of a blind, you know, kind of a fake out, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain moment. But here, when she's visiting the Westons, she sees a glimpse was caught through the blind of two figures passing near the window. And I thought that's interesting because I think that's the only two times in this book that the word blind is used. And that is just cool. Little Easter eggs for us. Yay, Jane. So... Jane Austen lets us wait until the very, very last chapter, or the, the last set of chapters, to give Harriet some satisfaction. How lovely that Mr. Martin never fell out of love with her, and clearly, I am sure, knew that Emma was influencing Harriet. But even perhaps more importantly, I think the way that Harriet's birth is dealt with in Jane Austen stands out to me so much from other books like, Pam, you know, Pamela and, and other books from this time period and a little bit earlier that were very much morality tales and judgy morality tales. Here, Harriet is a lovely and just fine person. As long as she stays in her lane, she's fine. But she is, in fact, illegitimate. Something happened to her mother her father was a tradesman who made enough money to put her up, but was decent enough for concealment. He was 
a good enough guy, a stand-up guy. Not surprisingly, apples falling from trees. He was a stand-up guy who didn't want to accidentally potentially taint Harriet's hopefully good name by associating her with a situation where she was illegitimate. Hopefully good name. You know, as she grew up, he was he would be hopeful that she would be able to take advantage of not having this kind of taint to her name and instead just be a good person on her own, which obviously she has done and she she won in the end, I think probably more than anybody else, which is lovely. It's not a Mr. Collins moment at all. And that's, that's happy. But that's, that also brings me to the end of the book. And like I said, I'm going to save most of these comments and larger questions for the live stream at the end. But one of the things that some people have, it's not that they have an issue with, it's just that it's a, a place where you can really come down on either side which is the last paragraph. Emma has been Emma all the way through the book. And of course, there's a dig from Mrs. Elton. She sounded extremely shabby and very inferior to her own. Thanks, Mrs. Elton. But in spite of these deficiencies, the ones that Mrs. Elton called out, the wishes, the hopes, the confidence, the predictions of the small band of true friends who witnessed the ceremony, this of Emma and Knightley, were fully answered in the perfect happiness of the union. So we have our perfect happiness again. But some people have pointed out that unlike other books, there's really no definite happily ever after here. And some people have pointed out Emma gonna Emma and the chances of her kind of falling back on bad behavior learned over her life, her current lifetime is probably pretty likely. And so there are some people who have a, a quite a cynical read on the end and some people who are more, no, she's learned her lesson. She's, she's got it. And now she has nightly and happiness to help kind of keep her in check. So I thought that was interesting though, because I know Emma is not everybody's favorite book. And I wondered if that might be part of why. Not that it's a good thing or a bad thing. I can see both sides of it. But yeah, I thought I should bring that up. I did love Emma's little, I called you George once, but it didn't bug you, so I stopped doing it. <laughs> I love her. There are days when I love her. Oh, and there was one comment that I, I forgot to, to bring up. At the end of our first chapter, at the end of 53, Mrs. Elton makes a, a crack about Knightley and Emma living together. And, you know, obviously, the, the first time that statement went by, my ears went, what? And it's not living together like we would consider it now. It's living in the same house together. And it makes perfect sense that this is what would happen. If, I mean, let's say it was going to take three months to get married. Fine. It's going to take at least that long for Knightley to figure out how to do this thing. And so moving his, his things that he's going to need on a daily basis from Donwell Abbey over to Hartfield it makes a lot of sense. And he's already there all the time anyway. And oh, by the way, there's always a chaperone because Mr. Woodhouse ain't going nowhere. So it's not sharing a bedroom until after they get married. But I loved that Mrs. Elton, of course, she has to bring up Maple Grove. She knew a family near Maple Grove who had tried it and been obliged to separate before the end of the first quarter. So before three months were up, they were done. I don't think that's going to happen here. And then that brings us to the end of the book. It's just lovely, but it's also a much more grown up, almost restrained end of the book that there are some people who tend to think of Jane Austen as being marvelously snarky and sarcastic, which she is, but they apply that to the end of this book, which I'm not sure I buy. There's a school of thought that Emma always screws up. Emma is not going to be able to continue demonstrating good behavior. And she's going to wind up hurting somebody again and, and doing something horrible. And Knightley is not going to be able to keep her in check. And it's going to cause friction and the end. I don't think so. I think she's smart enough to know that it's okay to be working on this. I think the, the snark is coming from Mrs. Elton. 
Mrs. Elton didn't go to their wedding, but got the particulars detailed by her husband. So she didn't bother to show up when Emma and Mr. Knightley got married. And his comments were that he thought it was all extremely shabby and very inferior to her own wedding. And then goes on, you know, not enough white satin and blah, blah, blah. My sister would be horrified. And then Austin ends, but in spite of these deficiencies, the wishes, the hopes, the confidence, the predictions of the small band of true friends who witnessed the ceremony were fully answered in the perfect happiness of the union. So we're back to our perfect happiness callback. And I don't feel like there's a whole lot of room for Jane Austen trying to telegraph to us that this isn't going to work. And I I would be fascinated if anybody else who's listening holds that opinion that this is all doomed to failure. Because I'm I'm not seeing it, which doesn't mean it's not there. It's just I'm not seeing it. So so yeah, let me know what you think. Again, 206-350-1642. Let me know in audio or email whether or not you want me to say your name, how to pronounce your name, honestly, and whether your comment is one that you want shared at all, or if it's just something you want to say, and and then I can kind of bring it up generally. All of these things are options. Just let me know. All right. I said at the end, I was going to give you the audio from Corviday talking about plastics, very important, useful information. So I'm going to share that and let that play you out. You have a great one. I will talk to you soon. Take care. And don't forget, when you watch the live stream, which we'll also edit and put out as audio, when you watch the live stream at the very end, I will let you know what the next book is going to be. All right. Have a great one. I will talk to you later. Bye. Hi, Shudder and your Netflix listener. It's Corviday. I binged all of the episodes that I was behind on today, and I took notes while listening, so I've got a bit to free for 63. Are you talking about using certain plastics to build other things? I don't remember entirely what you're talking about. Oh, yeah, the recycling company. If you're going to build a greenhouse with it, you have to be careful which plastics you're using, because some are not UV stable and break down, and if they can leave microplastics or off-gassing into your space. And if you have chickens in there, you don't want either of those. I just know that number five is safe to use for plants and reuse for food. It's not UV stable, but it doesn't break down quite the same way as detrimentally as others. There are websites where you can look at what all the different numbers of plastic mean. When you look at the bottom of the recycling symbol on the number side of it, I know that you can and you, number two plastic, which is the plastic that the caps on milk jugs and such are made from. Here's a group on YouTube down in furniture and stuff. It's really cool to watch. I'll send you a link to that. Also, there were people in Arizona working on a way to take number one plastic water bottles, like the really cheap ones that you should never reuse because they break down in the water you're drinking. The disposable water bottle turned it out at a venture are not good to reuse for anything. That's the one group, a couple of guys. Figure out a way to proffer from and turn them into filament for 3D printing. They were getting funding and they spread to other communities. I to do some digging to wherever they are, but there are efforts being made to these sort of things. I've done a lot of research to refer no, I'm a bit obsessed with sustainability and such. The arrowroot as a thickener for gravy. I'm going to already call it out of that, but I was like, don't boil arrowroot. It gets weird. But if you do the cooking of the frosters and reducing of them, then after you take it out, add arrowroot, it will work. She had better options. 624, talking about the for Woodhouse being thick. I sort of suspected throughout the rest of the story. I was like, hmm, frown. Familiar is really concerned about everybody. And when you are sick yourself, you become hyper aware of how it can affect other people. When they commented about the weather affecting him, I was like, oh, it evolves around life from those. I have what's called MCAS, not the test, but mass cell activation syndrome. It makes it so that you're pretty much allergic to the weather. Your body has an allergic reaction to weather changes and it adopts your. If I get too hot, I feel to be allergic to anything citing against my skin, like a blister. 
that's my stream level of it. Getting headaches and migraines from pressure changes, that chronic feeling weak, breaking out in hives from weather changes, not doing well in the hot or the cold. All, all of those are symptoms of mast cell activation syndrome. So that sounds like what he's got and makes a lot of sense why he hides in and is the way he is. It's rough. There's not much you can do about the weather. It's really hard to avoid the weather. Okay. So it was great catching up. And now I'm going to start binging Frankenstein for the next few weeks for to Halloween. Well, till I finish it. I guess it's going to be my, my Halloween book. Hope you're doing well, Heather. I'll see you on Thursday, hopefully. If you like what we do here, please consider liking and subscribing on iTunes, thumbs upping and subscribing on YouTube. You can visit patreon.com slash craftlit and become a patron of this art. And you can always go to Linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash craftlit channel. And from there, you can get links out to all of the social media, all of the places that Craftlet lives. It's it's a nice hub that you can go to to get all the stuff, all the good stuff. And I keep forgetting to mention, we also have a Facebook group with the loveliest group of people, as you might imagine. They're just awesome, makers and readers. And people who hadn't been readers before but are now. I like that. All right. You take care of yourself. Have a great one. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.